Welcome to week 5. The focus this week is assessment in science education. The assessment task number 1 is due at the end of this week and this topic uh, completes our, our 5 week series um, of topics for that particular assessment item. We begin from our textbook Greeks in figure 8.4 factors that affect how and what we assess. And there are multiple factors, there's no one thing that drives our assessment strategies. We can't ignore the fact that we have political agendas, um, we are in public institutions, we are public officers working with the public. Um, we also look at the effects of students learning, okay, uh, of our teaching on students learning, and we can also look at um, assessment in the classroom um, to basically support learning, assessment for learning. So we're going to look at these three different angles of um, learning and assessment and see how they come together to create assessment practices. So we can begin by saying assessments change. We no longer just look for what students have learned and give it a mark. Um, we collect data and that data must drive our actions at each stage of our teaching circle. So by the time we've covered uh, this topic and your assessment task, you should be pretty able to define assessment. You should be able to describe the difference between assessments for learning, assessment of learning, and assessment as learning, the lifelong learning um, uh, paradigm that seems to have sprung up in a lot of government policy. And finally, explain the different types of assessment. Now there's a range of different types of assessment. Um, we're going to look at them all and um, hopefully give you some ideas. You may already be using some in your assessment task number one in your learning sequence, part B. Um, you, you may get some ideas for things and adjustments that you want to make. At the end of this session, I'll be presenting you with a checklist that you can actually use to apply to your um, assessment task to basically look and see that your learning sequence is achieving what it can achieve in terms of uh, bona fide assessments, challenging assessment, engaging assessment. So our key terms this week, uh, a couple come up, criteria, and they're the performing characteristics an assessor takes into account when making a judgement about a student's response to the different elements of a task. So each task can be broken down or chunked. Each of those chunks has a criteria or a weighting attached to it. That's what we look for in assessment. Feedback is the process of giving information, timely information provided to students about their performance. Anyone who's ever trained a dog or a pet um, knows that it's all about reinforcement and the reinforcement, the information, is, has to be timely. It has to be very closely connected to a cat's or dog's behaviour in order for that dog to reinforce that. Same with students, very Pavlovian, very Skinner, but at the same time it's a very, very um, sound proposition. Formative assessment, the assessment that provides an opportunity for improvement on the same task within the same unit. So it's done on the run, formative assessment, it's done as part of the teaching and learning cycle and it's useful for both the teacher and the student. We'll talk about why. Summative assessment is that, you know, the old end of unit test. In science, unfortunately, it often takes the form of a multiple choice test, um, but even multiple choice tests, if you must use them, can actually be challenging and can you know, engage higher order skills and not just memory recall um, if we learn to, to apply those principles in our design. So when we look at assessment, the old bell curve comes up. Um, and we can see, for instance, that in many years of teaching, um, you know, you're, you're going to meet a very few percentage of, of your students are actually going to sit up in, in that A category. Um, we can see it's the great normaliser. Um, in the middle, we've got our, our 34 C pluses and C minuses, um, and that's the vast bulk. 68% of our students fall in, the, in that, uh, that middle criteria. We have some high achievers, and of course, and we have what we call the laggards at the end here. Um, that's just a bell curve. Now, bell curves can be distributed on pure raw score, or they can be distributed, for instance, by standards. For instance, you, know, you need to get a certain grade in order to meet a certain standard. Um, and you need to get us achieve a certain standard of performance in order to get a certain grade. So it's a little bit circular. So assessment is about forming judgments. Grading is about allocating levels. And the reasons why we assess can be quite you know, stringent and, and they can often conflict. So assessment is a government requirement. Um, it is there in, in the Education Act 2006. We do need to produce assessment and that assessment must meet the needs of a broad range of students. It can be diagnostic. We can di diagnose learning outcomes um, and, and therefore um, be very effective in our teaching. Um, it can be used as feedback for students and teachers, okay? a very strong purpose in assessment. Um, grading students, the extension of learning difficulties, um, it can help us to actually work out support and differentiation strategies. And ultimately it can prove motivating for students um, if the assessment we build is, is actually set at an appropriate level and offer sufficient and engaging variety, which we'll talk about more later. 
the assessment types. We've got three basic types that we're going to look at. Um, well, we could include a fourth. Um, the science by doing um, folk talk about diagnostic assessment as its own little um, assessment uh, type or strategy or focus. Formative is the second type they talk about, um, where it's done basically in the classroom and it's done as the teacher's teaching. And um, we can see these these two, you know, we look at, at the three different types of assessment we do for learning, of learning, and as learning. Um, we can see that, you know, we are assessing here for learning. We're actually looking to see how students are performing. Summative assessment is the big end of unit thing. Okay, it's what we do. We're going to look at a couple of different strategies. You don't n just have to do a, a pen and paper test. We're going to talk about a couple of different strategies later on that you can use as your summative assessment. And again, it's of learning. You're assessing the learning that's taken place. You're seeking to apply a mark or a grade. And you're also you know, then opening up the space for ranking. And of course, up at the senior end of the schooling, we all know about OPs okay, and the high stakes assessment that goes on there. And of course, a another type of assessment is, is self-reflective, where students can use assessment to further their own learning. And this is you know, what we do largely as a, as a professional course. Um, it's a bit more of an adult model, it's more uh, andragogy than it is pedagogy, but it's about learning, learning um, to be a problem solver, learning for lifelong applications. So when we look at assessment for you, um, you're going to experience assessment probably in this self-reflective mode quite often as a, as a, a pre-service teacher. Um, your assignments, for instance, are going to be summative in nature, where you're actually having uh, and being ranked and placed according to uh, your demonstrable outcomes um, against learning learning criteria. Um, and your assessment types here, hopefully, when you get online and you're using our online materials, you're using the forum, you're reading your textbooks, you're hopefully chatting with colleagues and, and, and partners and friends, you are going through the diagnostic informative phases. So assessment drives learning, and this is where we really need to start. Um, the challenges are simple yet profound. If you wish to improve the quality of learning, we've also got to learn to improve the quality of how we observe and measure learning. Um, so this is really that the, the key to this week's work and the key to your lesson uh, sequence. You are actually trying to address a misconception. If you're addressing that misconception effectively then your observations and measurements of student learning are going to need to capture the work that you've done as a teacher. And this whole idea resonates with the history of science and what science is. Um, in science we have this understanding that's evolved from our ability to observe and measure. Um, think about the birth of the telescope you know, and, and the advent of science since then. Um, every time we, we create a new device to observe and measure, um, you know, science takes a, a quantum step forward. It goes through another paradigmatic step. So in science education, one of the challenges is the common end of the unit term test is directly related to transmission models of learning. In other words, it's at Bloom's lower end. Recall, um, yeah, just knowledge recall and, and, and simple reproduction. So it's transmission of, of you know, scientific facts from one to another. And unfortunately, but um, many of the tests that pass as end-of-year tests and, and end-of-unit tests tend to em em uh, emphasise um, memorisation and low-level thinking. So it's a generalisation, um, but that's what we're here for, um, to generalise and then pull those generalisations apart or elaborate them. But you know, this is the whole purpose of the Australian curriculum, to get away from memory-driven, fact-driven teaching of science. So the challenge of assessment in science. Now I've, I've rolled out uh, Professor Dennis Goodrum again, um, and he's going to have a couple of colleagues with him in these a couple of uh, little videos I'm going to show you. He talks about the challenge of assessment in science, and it's, it's well worth a listen. To improve the quality of learning, we must also improve the quality of how we measure learning. The focus of this resource is on supporting teachers to build on and extend their assessment practice. In science education, one of the concerns is that the common end of unit test is directly related to the transmission model of learning. Unfortunately, many of these tests tend to emphasise memorisation and low level thinking. So we need to give some thought about how we can improve the quality of these summative tests. But more than that, we need to find ways that assessment can be a continuous and embedded process. As a profession, we recognise the importance of diagnostic and formative assessment. But the challenge is, how do we put these ideas into practice? Now research actually demonstrates that formative assessment, properly used, is one of the strongest strategies that a teacher has in their repertoire of practice. Um, 
and we'll talk about some of the research in the Zoom session this week and I'll also point you towards a couple of quotes in this session but we've only got so long to look at things this week so we'll keep moving along. So assessment in science education, the process of observation and measurement is continuous and embedded. This is something that uh, Dennis Goodrum says um, and that's the nature of formative assessment. It is continuous. For effective learning assessment also needs to be a continuous embedded process um, to complement observation and measurement. So not only are the students doing the observation and measurement, they're being observed and measured and this cycle continues to feed. Okay, they're interrelated. In considering the continuous element, we focus on three phases of assessment and these have been explained to us. Diagnostic, formative and summative. And in simple terms, this is really the beginning, the middle and end parts of the assessment process. So we'll look at each of them in turn now. Um, diagnostic assessment, diagnostic assessment um, normally occurs at the start of a unit of study and it should, should really be very, very obvious in your lesson sequence. In the medical field we talk about diagnosis and triaging, um, the ability to examine a person to determine the nature of a disease or ailment that may be affecting that person. The same with education and learning. There may be a concept or a misconcept that we are actually trying to address. You know, and before we can address it we actually have to understand the extent of it. So in education diagnostic assessment is used to determine a student's understanding of a concept or topic. We begin from that point. This is constructivist in its focus. Inquiry-based learning is constructivist in its focus. Let's reel out Dennis again and listen to what he's got to say. He's going to introduce uh, a young teacher, Matt, who actually deals with this. And of course this is um, this theme of, of uh, diagnostic assessment and this is from the Science by Doing assessment module which you have access to online. Let's start with Matt. Matt is exploring a technique for diagnostic assessment. He hopes that this technique will help him to answer the questions. Where are my students starting from? How can I take this into account when planning this unit of work? I find that diagnostic assessment is very useful when planning lessons. In the past when I first started teaching I didn't use it as much and what I was finding was that I'd assume kids had prior knowledge on a topic and they didn't. So I would have gone ahead and already planned a sequence of lessons and then had to go back because the kids didn't understand some of the things that I thought they would already know coming into the lesson. So I found that since I use a diagnostic assessment first, I can work out what they really do know. I don't just have to assume it. And then I can develop my lessons to cater for the needs of the students. So first of all, I want to get a bit of an understanding of what you guys already know about the moon. I want to make sure that I'm not just teaching you things that you already know and putting you to sleep every lesson. So I'm going to ask you guys a few questions. First of all though, to get us thinking, we want to know why is the moon important? Okay, it sits up there in the sky, we can see it at night, it looks like it's glowing and shiny up in the sky, but why is it important? Asama, why is the moon important to you? Because it gives us light at the night. Okay, so it gives us light at the night. So you're saying that sometimes when there's say a full moon in the sky, it lights things up and you can see your way around a little bit better? Excellent. Who else? Why is the moon important to someone else? Amy, why is the moon important to you? Um, you know which way to go if you're lost. Alright. After initially asking a very open question, Matt now wants to focus student attention on a particular concept. Okay, so that's really good. You guys obviously know a little bit about the moon already. But we want to know about something in particular to do with the moon. Okay, we want to know why it looks different in the sky at different times. And I've got a bit of a cartoon that I'm going to get up on the board. And we're going to try and work out um, why it looks different. Why is it that one night we look at the moon and it's nice and big, the next night there's virtually no moon there, another night there might be half a moon there? Some of you might have already learnt this in primary school, some of you might not know anything about it at all. And they said, last week when I looked at the moon, it was big. Now it's only half a moon, so it's changed. And then we've got someone here that's looking up at it and they're going, hmm, I wonder how that happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you guys to give me some ideas on why you think the moon looks different at different times, just like we did before. Oh, I find that cartoons are quite effective in eliciting responses from students because cartoons are something that they're used to looking at at home for entertainment purposes and things like that. So I find that it gets them engaged and it gets them interested. And generally, if you've got big chunks of text and writing up on the screen, students tend to switch off. They don't find it very interesting. But having a picture up there that you can refer to and then sort of promote discussion and so on from that seems to be more effective and engages the students a lot more. So down here, Nathan's got a bit of an idea. 
Nathan, why do you think that it looks different at different times? Well, the sun's on one side and you're on another, and when the sun lights up the part of the moon that it hits, and All you right. actually see that part. So the position of the sun and the moon, you think, might have something to do with it? All right, let's write that up then. Okay, and we're not going to say if ideas are right or wrong at this stage. I wanted a whole bunch of ideas. So that was really good. You guys had some fantastic ideas there, which was really good to see. So I'm just going to save this, so I've got a copy of this, um, and I can look at it for my planning. I found today there were only really a couple of kids that had a fairly good understanding of what causes the moon phases. Probably 90% of the class were um, a fair way off, so I think there's going to be a fair bit of work to be done. Um, just the phases, general ideas about revolutions of the sun, earth and moon, I'm probably going to have to plan a few lessons to work on that. But if I was to give that same lesson again to work out what kids knew about phases of the moon, I'd probably keep most of it the same. I think that it worked fairly well. What I would maybe consider doing is getting the kids to individually work on a task at some stage. I find that working in small groups, um, one of the kids might persuade the other kid to agree with their ideas. So if we've got kids working in pairs, then they might have conflicting ideas. So I'd probably add a little bit where I get the individual idea and maybe an individual explanation at the end. That's a really, really good point. Using a... Uh, um diagnostic assessment to get to their real understanding as distinct to their book learning. Now often kids will try to tell you things just to you know give you the answer you want and you know, children are basically very easy to willing to please and very keen as learners to to get the right strokes. Um, so bear in mind you know, it's really important that you do something diagnostic so that you're getting to what their real understanding is because as Matt quite rightly points out you can get quite surprised. Now a couple of really good things there um, that we saw him using he used what we call fat questions um, he began off, you know, why is the moon important? That's a really fat question. And then he used some skinny questions to push towards the points that he really wanted to get to the surface and to the front of the class. So at this diagnostic stage, you can see he is very much probing and facilitating the learning sequence. Very much what we call socio-cultural constructivism in, in action here. Uh, and if we accept that learning is the process of constructing understanding from experience, then it's really important that we have a picture of the students' ideas. We get their real world view as distinct to their book view. And many students are strong and persistent ideas that have been acquired from their experiences, and some of these, of course, are misconceptions. Some come from the language we use. You know, the sun rises in the morning. Well, clearly, you know, it's, it's a misconception born of, of a, a loose use of language, of symbolic and metaphorical language. Some come, however, some of our misconceptions come from direct experience. So for a student who is observing the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, then it's quite reasonable to assume that the sun ro revolves around the earth, as, as Ptolemy did. Um, and of course, up until the time of Galileo, um, it was a common held belief. Um, Galileo actually had to, to stone the church um, in many ways to, to get his scientific points across. So this whole notion about real versus book learning, um, if you can, you really work, pump that diagnosis pump those of that, that diagnostic assessment. Try and avoid the faking good, the things that students do. You know, develop techniques to get the real answer, not the right answer, and, and questioning. Going up and down Bloom's taxonomy, using your fat open questions, focusing down with skinny questions on particular items of content and on particular learners. Okay, so that you can actually get an understanding of what they're going. And bear in mind, as, as we saw with Matt, diagnostic, uh, diagnostic assessment is largely for the teacher. Now, he openly says to his students, you know, we're going to have some lessons on the moon, and I really want to know, before, you know, to help my planning, I really want to know um, what your current understanding of that is. So he's quite explicit about it. Formative assessment is the second type of assessment that we're going to talk about. This is the meddler in the middle. Now, we saw with the diagnostic, it's group-based. Okay, We can see the teacher doing a lot of stuff at the front of the room, the sage on the stage. Matt's working very hard. Okay, But with the formative assessment, we become the meddler in the middle. So we're looking here very much the focus primarily for the student or the students if we're working with them in small groups. It's the mechanism by which feedback is provided so we can help and guide and inform student learning. So really important stage formative assessment. It doesn't always have to be verbal. You, know, you can do thumbs up, thumbs down. You can have a card system, you know, red for I don't get it, yellow for I get some of it, green for yep I'm right, I understand this, and kids can just hold them up. You know, but the idea behind formative assessment is that feedback will assist the changes and construction of the student's final deep understanding. That's why we do it. 
and the term attempts to capture the sense that this assessment will provide information for the students evolving concepts, okay, for, for their developing knowledge concepts and also their procedural concepts too, or procedural knowledges related to science. While sometimes detailed feedback is important, students benefit from brief but continuous feedback and this is why formative assessment is so good. Okay, the teacher moving around, the meddler in the middle. And it also helps the teacher to adjust his or her teaching um, to what students need on the fly. So as, as you're on the run, you know, and all of a sudden the lesson is starting to, to peak and, you know, and you're about to move towards that concluding task or to that, 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 that realisation, um, you know, you want to know that you, the lesson is going to get there. So formative feedback is, and formative assessment is the way to do that. And, the, you know, the really good thing about it is in your mind you know the sequence of what you're teaching and you've got your, your written lesson sequence but in your mind you know what you're doing you break it down into small steps and you attach a little formative assessment item to each of those steps to assume and measure and monitor that students are actually coming with you on this learning journey um, an ex example here from a teacher by the name of Kim um, now Kim accidentally, um, she set out to do some um, diagnostic assessment but actually finished up um, doing largely formative assessment of the previous unit the students had done. So um, again, you may find yourself in that particular position and again I'm urging you to build it into your lesson plan. Let's have a look and see what happens for Kim. Now it's time to meet Kim. Kim is part way through an energy and ecosystems unit and wants to check where her students thinking is at. Note how Kim plans to repeat the assessment task in a few weeks' time. This will provide evidence of how students' thinking has changed by the learning opportunities that are provided. Kim is using this technique to help her answer the questions. How are the students progressing as the unit of work unfolds? Where do they need constructive feedback, additional support or challenge? Where does the unit of work need to be modified on the fly to best address student needs? I'm actually about to start a, a new bit of a section of ecology and I want to actually know what the students know already about the topic. I don't actually want to spend too long on material that they already know, that they've had exposure to. So in order to um, do a bit of a pre-test, I'm going to use a concept map uh, for that purpose, diagnostically. And then I'll come back to um, the students and do another concept map down the track so I can see the progression uh, between their understanding of concepts now and later and uh, hopefully my teaching methodology will enable any gaps to be plugged that I am aware of when I have a look at those first uh, concept maps. So I'm going to start up a concept map on the board here just to interrelate these factors that we came up with yesterday and then we're going to move on to a concept map using some more words and develop the ideas further. Kim uses some concepts with which students are already familiar to model how to construct a concept map. That population has needs and those needs are abiotic factors. The link between population and abiotic factor, okay, I'm going to draw an arrow like that and I'm just going to put needs, right, population needs abiotic factors. We've named some abiotic factors there so we've got, for example, examples of abiotic factors. Oxygen might be an example. So I'm just going to put aerobic respiration here. So I'm making the links between the words, one idea or one concept and another. I'm putting a line and on that line or on that arrow, I'm putting the link. Right, so then I'm building up a concept map. We're actually moving to extend our concept map into relationships between the abiotic factors and the biotic factors in the environment. And I need to know how much you know about biotic factors so that I can plan the next few lessons. All right? Some of you might know quite a lot from primary school and from year eight. Some of you might not know all of the ideas yet, so I want to just get a picture of that so that I know how to plan. Competition relates to predation, doesn't it? Because competition would be in the food chain on the food web, because competition is basically there's one food source and two people want it. Yeah, but so then but wouldn't competition be a pred predation from under competition? We said that biotic is to do with living, all right, but we're not talking about you know living, non-living, dead anymore. We're talking about living and non-living. 
Yeah. So non-living factors rather than dead factors. Okay. Although unintended, this exercise resulted in good formative assessment of the previous work done on abiotic factors. Um, what does abiotic mean? Abiotic are physical features, so we've got things like temperature, nutrients, oxygen, currents. It's physical factors that affect a living thing in its habitat. Uh, I wanted to use this diagnostically. I think that the students weren't as far on in their understanding as I actually thought they were. And what is bio? That's where we've got relationships between living things. So, for example, the relationship between a parrot and the food that it eats, for example, in the morning, and I see this whole group of flock of parrots come down for the olives that grow on the olive tree near me, and that's the relationship between the biotic components oh, like the of the environment. Trends. Yeah, okay, all right. I was a bit nonplussed when they actually didn't know the difference between abiotic and biotic factors, which is something that we have gone over very quickly. For me, that's an insight into the fact that I haven't probably taught that topic uh, or that lead up very well, and I need to remediate that. See the CD-ROM for further information and practice about how concept map. Yes, I do recommend you get onto the CD-ROM and have a look. Um, and that's quite quite astute, I think, of Kim to actually admit um, that you know she's engaged in some teaching here, and it's only by going back and and doing uh, what she thought was a setup, a diagnostic setup for her new unit, that she's actually identified gaps in her teaching in her old. So it's it's in the previous unit. So it's really important um, to see and value the, the you know the, the whole experience of formative. Um, learning uh, and, and formative assessment. Um, this is one from a teacher by the name of Rosemary. Rosemary has followed a similar procedure to design an investigation using a cotton wheel racer. How did we transfer that energy? Connor, can you tell us how this transferred energy? Yeah, it like moved along the ground. And how did it do that? Like the force from the lucky band like pushed it. Okay, so if I just put this down like that, I can't see that the force is pushing it. No, you have to like twist the thing. Okay, you have to twist this around. Okay, excellent. And Kyle, you had an idea of what what happened when it started to untwist? Um, potential energy transferred to kinetic energy. Uh, potential energy that was in the elastic band transferred to kinetic energy. Excellent. For our data that we have, the best graph might be what, Jasmine? The line graph. The line graph. Who can tell me maybe a reason why it might be the best type of graph? Nick. So we can see the change um, on how, how much the distance increases with the number of twists or the variable. Okay, so we're looking at doing two sets of data and we're looking at the change, but what else might it be? Uh, we're using decimals. Okay, so when we are using decimals, we actually call this continuous data. So if we've got data that can go up by little bits, it's too hard to draw our bar and column graphs, which are discrete data. Um, I really wanted them to understand why we graph the way we do and how to graph and that you know all of the appropriate pieces of equipment that we need for graphing and that it does take time and it needs to take care um, with you know what you're doing. Plus I also wanted them to understand that um, another way of representing some data other than a table was in graphical format and I wanted them to see how they could do that themselves from their own experiments, so using a, a real sort of life investigation. Let's just hear what Rosemary has to say about formative assessment. Now she doesn't actually use that term, but that is what she is describing. So what I'm going to be doing is obviously collecting their work. Um, I've collected it once just to have a look at it already and see where they were going. And what I was able to do there is if there were a few kids that had problems with variables or anything, like predictions, etc., up to the point, um, and they did have some problems with hypotheses that I was able to go over um, that with them and then I provided them with their work back. We've gone through it again and I'll have another look at, at the work and provide some feedback to them either individually if it's only one person that's having an issue or I can provide that, you know, like I'm doing an example on the board, like this is what you might have thought you did, this is really how we're supposed to do it or some people did it this way and others did it that way. So I'm showing them also different ideas. Um, so it's ongoing sort of feedback for them. And then 
when I collect this work at the end, because I've had that input with them, so when I go to market, um, they would have had an opportunity to get um, to put in um, my suggestions or any suggestions that I've given the whole class into their work so that when they're handing the, their final product in, it should be hopefully of a higher quality than it would have been if I hadn't been providing that ongoing feedback. Really interesting um, uh, reflections there. Um, and I do bear in mind, as uh, A, it was a nice small class, um, that if you hopefully you noticed that as well. But B, she was using some very, very good questioning techniques once again. So we can sort of see the, the importance of, of the teacher framing the, the formative inquiry there. Um, summative assessment is the third one we want to look at. Um, and, and it's, of course, it's the end of unit of study, where we, we sum as in whole. Um, we're actually looking at their, glo their holistic and their global understanding of the, the unit of study we've just taught. It's a summary of how and, what and how well the student has learned. Um, and so the information we glean from summative assessment is, is really the stuff of a grade. It gets converted into a grade and the grade gets reported to parents and students. And of course, this is the, the, you know, the metrics of the education system. And it's commonly associated with an end of unit pen paper and, and, and pencil tests. And, and the key thing with those paper and pencil tests is really two key principles. And one is the important, if you're going to use pencil and paper tests, it, the importance of quality. It's more important to have fewer quality assessment items that effectively determine and measure what the student understands, rather than having a battery of, of items that are similar with the tendency to only measure a student's memory. So it's really important that you, know, uh, you, you foster um, really rich and engaging assessment tasks, you know, that they are deeper, they're targeting students deeper understandings. And another important principle is that of variety. Um, you need to have a variety of techniques so that you as a teacher can be confident the students understood the science ideas. And different students are going to have different learning modalities, they're going to have different learning preferences. Um, so they're going to perform better in some items than they will in others. So again, variety and quality, make your instruments deep and make them few but make them varied. Okay, a couple of principles there of summative assessment. We can look at summative assessment in a range of um, techniques. You know, it doesn't have to be a pen and paper test. Um, you know, and, and, and a couple of these are, are really worth considering. I've, I've put in here uh, self-assessment um, as a, a summative tool as well. And students can engage in self-assessment strategies. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but they can only do that when they have a sufficiently clear picture of the targets their learning is meant to attain. So it's really important that if you, you know, if you are going to engage in, in um, meaningful assessment, that you know, the learners become quite um, explicit and clear in what your understandings of that are. So interviews are a really interesting strategy. Um, and interviews can be both diagnostic and formative. Um, you can kick a lesson off, you can begin your inquiry task with an interview, and what it means basically is sitting beside students and going through the, the small groups and working through their understandings in interview style. Concept maps, as you can see, can figure in each, each assessment um, model. Notebooking. We can see also diagnostic and formative. You can do it as a journal and also make it a little bit summative as well. Um, but it's pr primarily diagnostic and formative. Rubrics are formative and summative. So you can give students a rubric, say, in lesson two, and sort of say, here's what we're going to do, here is the outcomes, and here are the standards I want you to achieve. And by the end, they can even self-assess themselves against the standards outlined in that rubric. I mean, you have an assessment rubric for this subject. So, you know, again, we're quite familiar with how they operate and, and why they're used. Portfolios. Um, I, I lean very much towards portfolio assessment where I can. Um, because in a portfolio, for instance, you can include, legitimately include, pen and paper tests, multiple choice tests, um, but students actually bring up their portfolio, that they sit with you, it's an interview, one-to-one -one interview style, and you actually get the students to talk to their portfolio, highlight aspects of their portfolio that they think are strong, and aspects that they think are, could use a little more work. Um, so we're getting them to, again, quite a bit of self-assessment there as they're looking at their own portfolios. And of course, you've got the variety and the quality of instruments in there as well. Student reports, formative and summative, a great way to do it. Do a conference, reports, do it as a wiki, um, create a website, do whatever it is you want to do. Self-assessment, um, we'll probably leave that one last and come back to that. Um, but self-assessment is... Students standing back and making an objective assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of their work, and I talked about the portfolio in that sense. It works best if they're provided with some guidelines when looking at their work, and often a checklist, for instance, or a rubric is a really good thing to help them structure their own self-assessment. And it, it really helps students work out what they need to do to improve the quality of their work when you use it formatively, um, or it may be used to compare information with the teacher um, 
when used summatively. So, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's a really a feedback uh, analysis tool. So when the teacher gives you your feedback, um, you know, the student can actually write their own assessment uh, report, do some self-assessment, and the two can actually be held together as, as if you like, a, you know, a 180 degree assessment uh, exercise. And peer review, peer review is um, quite, a, quite a good strategy and I, I think working in, in small groups, usually um, pairs, um, the critical friend model is always a good one. It's quite a formative one. The students look at each other's work and the reviewer gives feedback, um, including weaknesses. Um, we try not to use the term weakness, but what we try to do is, yeah, um, bouquets and brick bats, I suppose, you know, okay, throw me some bouquets, what's good about this? Okay, is there a brick bat in the room or, or on the page? Get them to use, you know, an alternate language that, that avoids judgment. Um, but peer reviewing um, reinforces feedback. But and feedback doesn't only need to come from the teacher, and that's the great thing about peer review. Um, it, you know, it's it's not teacher centric. It's a really nice. The teacher can structure the review, um, and structure the the, the, the content and comments, and uh, educate the students on on how to give feedback, which is really important. But essentially, it's it's an exchange between two two learners, um, in a co-construction model, and and it's um quite a rich rich method for assessment. What the experts say about assessment. There's a couple of different quotes here. Um, the performance of students on open investigation task varies with task and context. A judgment based on a single work sample would therefore be unreliable. So it's, again, it's pushing, hackling is pushing towards broad-based portfolio approach of work samples is the most effective. And again, it's a sympathy of mine as well. Self-assessment by pupils is not a luxury, it's essential, says Black and Williams. When anyone is trying to learn, feedback about the effort has three elements, recognition of desired goal, evidence about a present position, and some understanding of a way to close the gap between the two. This is a, a researcher, Albrecht, 1995, came up with this whole thing of gap analysis, and it's taken hold in self-assessment. Okay, So we can have a look and see where students want to be, where they are, and then they get into this, this cognitive process of working with um, a, 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 a leader or a teacher, um, as that teacher steps them through as the more capable other, in, in, through constructivist steps, towards a deeper understanding. So, you know, it's, it's self-assessment is, is a rich tool as well. Transferability means you've learned how to adapt to prior learning to novel and important situations. In an education for understanding, learners ch constantly challenge to make various ideas and resources, such as content, they encounter and become adept at applying them to increasingly complicated contexts. Assessment should encourage longer-term understanding, enable the provision of detailed diagnostic information to support learning. All skills have to be used in some context, and scientific process skills are only scientific if they're applied in the context of science. So we saw um, Rosemary, for instance, with her work on the graphs. Great science inquiry skills. You know, what model of information, what, what information tool is best going to capture these relationships? Really, really good stuff. And the present emphasis in secondary schools on traditional testing that focuses on the extent to which students memorise recall science facts hinders the development of meaningful understanding. Again, this is Dennis Goodrum and his research team, and you can see that there's a fair bit of consensus amongst the experts as to what actually constitutes um, assessment and what constitutes effective assessment. So if we have that consensus, then how did we get NAPLAN? Well, NAPLAN, as you know, is, is numeracy and literacy testing on a, glo on a, a national level. And it takes place at different purposes and, and different uh, levels of the curriculum, uh, all the odd years, three, five, seven, nine. Um, it's really interesting. Um, it's ongoing formative assessment within classroom for the purpose of monitoring learning and providing feedback to, to teachers to inform their teaching and for students to inform their learning. So it's, you know, it, it's globally accepted. Um, assessment takes place in the Australian curriculum. Um, it's different levels. Um, it's been nationalised and standardised in years five, three, seven, and nine. Um, the level of achievements in, in literacy and numeracy are in all embedded in the NAPLAN program. It produces useful national information, particularly for monitoring the progress of individual states and territories. The NAPLAN reports this time round um, suggest that uh, South Australia and the Northern Territory are in, in, in a little bit of trouble. South Australia is the, the least performing state in, in all categories and the Northern Territory um, uh, uh, you know, got half the level of competency among some of its Year 3 and 5 students that the rest of the states have. So there's some glowing uh, gaps there for those two states and some glowing challenges, clearly.
Um, another thing about NAPLAN is we're seeing this tendency for teachers to teach to the test instead of improving literacy and numeracy. Um, and this happens with standardised teaching. It's uh, come out of America. Unfortunately, it has a very strong following. Um, their nearest neighbour, Canada, for instance, has a totally alternate education system. And, of course, you're probably quite aware that the American uh, education system is about 17th in the world. So it's, it's you know, based on standardised data, teachers teaching to standardised tests. And what we're seeing is that literacy and numeracy are really fossilising. We're not seeing any real improvement in them. Um, in Australia, it was a, a quite a surprise that we saw some mild improvements. Um, but bear in, large, uh, bear in mind um, that standardised testing really does not produce the sorts of changes that it's, it's um, held to produce. Um, but it does provide useful information. Um, and unfortunately, it, it's also a significant draw out of the, um, the teaching year. If you think about the amount of time you have with a group of students in, in, in any given year, it, um, it's certainly the, there's an overweighting being given to the NAPLAN process and to central teaching processes. So it's um, to centralised teaching. It's, it's, uh, unfortunately, it, it takes time away from other aspects of the curriculum. And you know, there's been a strong call for quite a while now for science to have its own uh, you know, side plan, if you like, um, that science becomes a, um, a nationally benchmark strategy as well. So um, you know, who knows where this will end? Um, we know that we've got the international PISA, we've got TIMS, we've got um, you know, a range of international measures which are you know, ranking OECD countries. We know in PISA that ratings Australia is slipping in relation to our OECD neighbours. So what does that tell us? It's just information. Okay, it's just feedback. It's what we do with it that really matters. Planning for assessment um, is the last little activity that uh, I want us to, to have a look at. Um, there's three steps basically in planning for assessment and this connects directly to your, your learning sequence. Um, step one is you identify key intended learning outcomes. So we don't assess everything. Okay, you actually apply weight to the things that you really want um, students to know. And you should do this on a, on every, in every lesson every day. You, you have your content, your mandatory content that you need every student to get. And then you have your desirable content that you think some of the brighter students or quicker students might get to. And then you have your extension content, of course, for your gifted and talented and bright kids. But you must identify them in every lesson you do, in every sequence you teach. Identify it up front, make it explicit, and teach to it. You then align the, the assessment task with the intended learning outcomes. Um, so, you know, the, the instrument must match the outcomes. It must be of the right uh, genre. It must be of the right discourse. Um, and it must target the, the you know, the, the right curriculum areas. And then the third thing you do, step three, is design learning activities to provide opportunities for students to develop the full range of intended outcomes. So you would learn. Uh, have learning activities geared towards drawing graphs, geared towards different types of graphs and, 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 and uh, physical representations of data. So there's a whole range of ways of looking at this. Um, this last little video is an example of two teachers who've actually um, talking about how they view planning. Listen to the way Meg and Bob go about their planning. I'm planning a unit on forces. Firstly, I'm going to use an interview technique with some challenging prompts to uncover the student's current level of thinking. I expect several opportunities for follow-up practical tasks to come out of those interviews. I also want to explore using a rubric to provide feedback on at least one practical task, and I'll include some questions focusing on process skills in that task. I'm thinking I'll have a go at writing some questions using Bloom's higher order thinking skills to guide me quite straightforward and probably replicates some of your own. I'm planning a unit on living things. I'm going to try using a cartoon scenario as a starting point. I'll find out on what basis students currently classify things as living or non-living. I want to use a class checklist for a hands-on classification task as this should show me if any of the students are getting tripped up on a particular criterion. I have a feeling movement will be tricky. It will show me at a glance if the students are relying on using only one characteristic consistently and ignoring the others. I'll finish off the unit by using a second cartoon scenario to check for shifts in their thinking. They'll need a strong understanding of this topic before we move on to ecosystems. Now you can see how this, this planning process has actually flipped 
what we would normally do as teachers. Often we tend to grab hold of our content and say, oh, how am I going to teach that? And from there, uh, the temptation is to look at process. And once you get your content and process together, you then look at your capture, your assessment. How am I going to assess? But instead, these teachers are actually saying, well, if I think about what I've got, what per uh, uh, assessment strategies are open to me, and the resources I've got to use, um, I can build my teaching, I can build my unit planning from there. Okay, and again, the use of a checklist. So before you submit assessment task number one, have a look at this checklist. Okay, please make it a little bit of a note of it. I'll, I'll make it uh, available to people um, via the, the um, forum. But have you included tasks to uncover misconceptions and or the student's current level of understanding or skill? If so, give yourself a tick. Does your learning sequence incorporate a number of assessment strategies, cartoons, rubrics, the diagnostic, formative and summative assessment? Okay, multiple, variety. Include a variety of tasks so the student has multiple opportunities. We can see that happening there. Uh, it can't just be a case of one-off opportunity to demonstrate understanding. Uh, learning is also about rehearsal and rehearsal does require um, repetition. Include opportunities to assess both understanding of concepts and process skills. The graphing, for instance, is really you know really well done by Rosemary. Make assessment criteria explicit. Supply a rubric before students begin a task so they know what their key behaviours are. Okay, it's really important that if they're going to demonstrate learning, they need to know what it's supposed to look like. Make it explicit to them. Incorporate opportunities for frequent feedback on student work. Yeah, have you built that in? Ensure that evidence of student learning will, will serve as a guide for the next appropriate step in learning. Okay, are you doing your formative checks as you go through? Have you got your thumbs up, thumbs down? Have you got your cards? Have you got your little group questions? Provide students with opportunities to demonstrate the mastery of concepts and process skills by applying these to new contexts. In other words, extend and transfer the learning. And yeah, let's not just make it transmit the learning, transfer the learning. And consider opportunities for student self-assessment and peer assessment where possible. Great strategies. And consider opportunities for working with colleagues to design the work unit, including developing agreed assessment criteria to determine student progress. Um, you know, you really shouldn't be doing uh, your teaching in a silo. Uh, where possible, you should be part of a learning community and dealing with that. That concludes the content uh, for week five. Um, we could have gone on forever. It's a rich topic assessment. I haven't done anything too controversial. Uh, it's been largely descriptive, but you know, uh, assessment is a contest. Um, what we assess is a contest. How we assess is, is a contest, and and why we assess is also a contest. And as teachers, there are a range of camps into which we fall, depending on on our approach and our philosophy around assessment. I've largely avoided much of that in this session, instead going for a, a bare bones approach to how you're going to incorporate assessment into your um, learning sequence for assessment task number one. That's not an excuse, that's a justification. <laughs>